wet. And the player is hurt over in that pool of water. They're cold. Very pleasant. He actually got frostbite in his toes. They caused some problems. And the big question now, can this contest continue? But boy, were they memorable. What a catch! Eddie Brown! Touchdown, Edmonton! The top 10 crazy CFL weather games are next. Let's play. Let's play. Uh, hi, everybody, and welcome to another Sports Center Top 10 special. I'm Darren Detition. We are glad that you tuned in. You know, we are so fortunate to live in such a fantastic country, but with it comes some pretty crazy weather that can wreak havoc with our day to day lives and with our football. Let's begin our countdown of the CFL's craziest weather games with some cold and windy conditions in Grey Cups. The normal Winnipeg temperature on the 24th of November is about minus 4 degrees. Let's not kid anybody today. It is cold in Winnipeg. Nobody had any business being on a football field. The temperature is minus 18 degrees Celsius. It is substantially below normal. It was a game of survival more than it was a game of, uh, of football. It was... I believe the coldest game that I've ever played in. When you hit someone in extreme cold, you feel it. The turf was frozen, we were frozen, they were frozen, the water was frozen, everything was frozen. 52,000 watching this 79th Grey Cup game. Some Arctic air moved in, and as a result, the mercury has plummeted. Reggie Pleasant, who was a cornerback uh, for us, he actually uh, got frostbite in his toes in that particular game. The comical part is there was no trust talking, because everybody was just trying to get through to the next play. It was one of the quietest games I've ever played. They want to see what wind conditions are like in the second half, and the Calgary Stampeders will have that advantage. It was one of those things when Rocket Ismail had a step, it may as well have been 50 yards. The Rocket looks for a hole. By the time he was at midfield, the crowd was cheering. If he gets to the outside this time, he's gone. Goodbye. The Rocket delivers an 87-yard kickoff return. It was poetic justice when the beer can came onto the field. When you look at it, it was nothing can stop it, not even a flying object. That will guarantee a Toronto Argonaut Grey Cup triumph. That was the most painful game I have ever played. I'm glad it's over. Grey Cup 1965. With the wind making whipped cream on Lake Ontario, the scene was being set at the CNE Stadium for the Battle of the Gale Ball. Game I'd like to forget. <laughs> Western champions, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers versus the powerful Eastern representatives, the Hamilton Tiger Cats, were on the field today, determined to bury the bomber jinx. Going back to receive Thornton, Rainey, and Lewis. Here is John Southern up to the ball, and the 37th Grey Cup is underway. It goes over Rainey's head into the end zone. The gusting wind affects even the football. When the first kickoff went into the end zone and out of bounds, no penalty, but the Tiger Cats Cats must do it all over again. It was almost unheard of. You're allowing to make more yards and get better field position by gambling on third down, not even making your first down. Then you would kick him. That's the type of wind it was. Third down and four yard situation. I can remember Charlie got one up in the air and we took off and we <laughs> saw so we stopped. We <laughs> waited and it come down. We had to jump on it pretty quick. 15 yards back of that line of scrimmage. He wants to take a little extra time because he's kicking into that wind. And oh, look at the wind. He's got a hook. Elmer, Elmer almost took his own ball. You never knew where it was going to end up. When we were down in that situation, facing the wind, deep in our end zone, we'd rather give up the safety of two than we were to uh, not make it and give up the ball that deep where they would have just walked in. Faced with gale-like winds, Coach Bud Grant called for the second safety touch to retain possession and set Grey Cup history, and again, the Bombers conceded two points. It was the first time that a Grey Cup team had conceded three safety touches. I know there was quite a controversy about it because of the safeties and the wind. The score, Hamilton 21, Winnipeg 13. Ended up the difference in the game, but I think if we had to do it all over, same circumstance, we'd done the same thing. 
woke up that morning and the snow was coming down. The field conditions have deteriorated even though they've been cleaning this field for three hours. It continues to snow heavily. It was just a, a beautiful day, snow on the ground and it kind of just made the whole championship and, and picture of that game that much more perfect. The Eskimos champions of the West, the Argos class of the East, the 84th Grey Cup is on the line. You have a game this much snow, this much inclement weather, you're not going to score very many points. And then... First down, Edmondson with the football, McManus going up top for Eddie Brown! What a catch! Eddie Brown! Touchdown, Edmondson! We stack two receivers, one guy goes deep, the trail guy has an option route. Eddie Brown, he was our deep guy. Uh, I've seen it on tape a thousand times, and I, I did see it well. It was just a phenomenal play, especially under the condition. Then you come back, and Jimmy the Jet has the answer. Cunningham from his 30, across the 35, and Jimmy Cunningham's doing it again. Cunningham is going to score. Touchdown, Toronto. They were amazing plays by both sides all day long. And this is Gizmo Williams. Henry Williams with a crease, and now he'll get outside over midfield. Henry Williams, Vanderjack trying to track him down, won't do it. Gizmo scores. We didn't get uh, a lot of the breaks, if you will, during the course of the game, but we got one huge break. Third and less than a yard. Flutie will keep. Not much there. Ball popped loose. I think this play was blown dead way too soon. The ball out clearly at the snap that should be an Edmonton Eskimo football and Ronnie Lancaster out on the field incensed the fact that the play was blown dead and was not called a fumble it wasn't as big a deal as the fact they gave us a first down no turnovers in the game but there should be one it may very well have won the game for us uh, and there's no two ways around it double blue and gray cup champions in 1996 the images i have of that game the still photos from after that game it was really a slice of canadian football the day before believe it or not we were outside in shorts and t-shirts and running around the field and then we know what it's like in calgary all of a sudden, it was 40 below zero. Defending champion Montreal and Edmonton prepare for their second consecutive meeting in Canada's professional football championship, the Grey Cup. 1975, in my mind, will go down as the coldest day uh, I ever spent in my life. We were offered one of the big blowers to warm our hands. Marv Levy said, no, 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 no. If you take the blower, you're not going to be men. You've got to be tough. You've got to be tough. We're going to give our blower to Edmonton. Edmonton had two blowers. Jones. Larry Smith on a little swing pass. A short four yards, and that sets up a field goal try. Don Sweet from 35 yards out is good. The difficulty was not the ball, or it was not the field itself. It was actually the ball was just like a rock. They brought out our summer mesh jerseys with the big holes in them, and they forgot to bring our winter jerseys. So here it is, all of us wearing little t-shirts, cut off gray t-shirts with our shoulder pads. Wade came off the bench to lead the Owls to the Grey Cup last year. Can he do it again? And then with about a minute 30 left, uh, Sonny made three plays. Montreal needing a field goal to win. Dumps a pass to Larry Smith. Well, I was lucky enough to make one play for about 30 yards, and then Joe Perry made a 40-yard reception. He's looking for Joe Petty. And he's got him. Mike Fink keeps Petty from going all the way. I guess it was about the 19-yard line with two seconds left to go. And I'm going, all right, we're going to win the Grey Cup. And the Alouettes on the Edmonton 15. Plenty close enough for a winning field goal try. Jones has trouble placing the ball. The kick is wide. But the Alouette bench can't believe it. Eskimos concede the single point, making it a 9-8 game. And victory for the Edmonton Eskimos. I don't think I ever missed anything inside of 30 yards in years and years. And to miss an 18-yarder, uh, it, it means so much. Um, it's something that I've lived with. It was like we never played the game. Because when you lose a great cup like that, it's like you were never there. You survived the first four. Up next, an all-star game turns into anything but a sunny walk in a park. They gave us some nice barley soup at halftime, laced with some rum. Welcome back to the show. As most of you know, Vancouver is a beautiful city, one of the prettiest in the world, but it does get its share of rain. And on November the 28th, 1971, there was plenty of it for the Grey Cup game at Empire Stadium. Add in brand new artificial turf, 
and you've got the recipe for disaster. At least that's the way it worked out for the 1971 Toronto Argonauts. Here are moments six through four. To set the stage for the nation's 60th championship football classic, the Grey Cup. Well, it had rained for two or three days. This was the first Grey Cup to be played on an artificial surface. And the way the field was arced, you know, it was supposed to drain off on the side, but it really didn't. The Stampeders arrive, seeking Calgary's first Grey Cup in 23 years. And Toronto Argonauts, Eastern champions for the first time since 1952. You could run, it was splash, you slide in, it, you tackled, I mean, it was, it was terrible. A brilliant catch by Rudy Linderman. 40 yards down the sideline, and Luster makes the tackle. The ball is loose. The Argos recover. The only problem was the, the ball it was slippery. And of course, when you got tackled, you started sliding. <laughs> it was just a matter of who was going to condition themselves to play that game in that condition would come out victorious. Three minutes and 30 seconds to play in regulation time in the Great Cup game. 14 to 11, Calgary. Keeling from the Calgary 30, throwing deep for Henderson. Intercepted by Tricky Dick Thornton of the Toronto 45. After Dick intercepted the pass, as he was running towards that end zone, that's where the car sat that went to the MVP of the Grey Cup. <laughs> and all Dick Thornton could think about in his mind was that car is mine, that car is mine. And at the 12-yard line, Dick Thornton has Toronto in scoring range, 2.26 to play. McQuay, looking, 11-yard line, lost the ball. That's the, that's the indication. I was standing on the sideline watching him, and he went to make a cut. And he slipped. McQuay heads toward the goalposts. Then the costliest fumble of the year. Well, actually, uh, he hardly hit at all. He was, I was forcing the sweep on that side. And he planted to cut up, and I planted to come in, and we both get dumped, and he fell down the ball pump. And now I remember coming to the sidelines after after uh, Leon fumbled, and I looked at Dick, and he went, that car's not mine anymore, is it? And I said, no, it's not. Calgary 14, Toronto 11. Stampeder fans have waited 23 years for this moment, and the Calgarians go wild. Today, the site of the final Canadian football game for 1956. The all-star game that we played out there, and, and both of them, I think, were, were, were rather nasty days, wet and cold. And the reason I, I seem to remember that is they gave us, uh, they gave us some nice barley soup at halftime and laced with some rum. According to the Weather Bureau, Vancouver receives an annual precipitation of just under 59 inches. And on this particular day in December, the city is in luck. It's getting all of it today. Always, as you'd imagine, uh, uh, slippery and wet and miserable after you got tackled. If you hit on the ground and uh, in certain areas of the field, it, uh, it really was uh, icy cold water. And you didn't want to get that in your pants. Really. Right, been a broken field running by now, but he loses possession of the football. It's loose. I guess um, the All Star game at that time meant. Uh, that you were, were one of the best, best players in the league. Norm Kwong cracks over into pay territory, the first score of the ball game. Little Norm Kwong shivering and shaking on the sideline. Somebody called me and said we lost 30 to nothing. And I wasn't a bad offensive guard, but I said, how the hell did that happen, you know? The game is over. The West 35, the East nothing. The Big O, Montreal's Olympic Stadium. 48 hours before an unexpected winter storm from the south ended Indian summer, forcing fans and players alike to endure wintry weather at this year's Grey Cup Championship. The weather was terrible. There had been a big snowfall the night before. We got in the stadium, we go in the field, and all of a sudden we look at the field and say, God, it's covered with snow and ice. Well, it's obvious the fans are ready. Over 68,000 from every part of Canada. The third Grey Cup meeting between these two teams in the last four years. And then I guess what they tried to do was clean the field off as best they could. So two-thirds of the field was basically ice. I guess about an hour and a half before the game, Tony Proudfoot said, you know, uh, I found this staple gun and I'm going to put like staples in my shoes. The nipples in the bottom of the shoe were probably about 20 to 30 on the bottom. And you put a staple this way and a staple that way and it had like a four-star stud. And what happened was it actually gripped the ice. Slapped fumbled, and 
Tony Crown foot recover. He was making cuts and it was amazing. So all of a sudden, we found out who the fellows were in the maintenance area, and we had about 10 staple guns, and so all you could remember was that sound of ta 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 Don Sweet is called in for his fifth field goal attempt. 30 yards, and it's good. Uh, did it make a difference? I think it did. If it didn't, any, if it didn't uh, any other way, it did psychologically because I felt I had it. Obviously, it did make a bit of a difference, but the real difference that day was how our defense played in, in the second half. It, I think it was 6-6 at the half, and uh, we took off at halftime and beat them 41-6. It's intercepted, picked off by Vernon Perry, his second of the day, as turnovers continue to plague the Eskimo. With the conditions that existed at the time on the field, it became apparent that the ice bowl would be a great name. And the game the Eskimos won a lot of Grey Cups after that, but that's one they didn't win. As the top 10 crazy CFL weather games continues, when a roster guide won't help you figure out who's who. That game did not resemble the game of football, but it's still a game. The dirtiest game in CFL history is next. <laughs> Now, back in the day, the CFL East and West Finals used to be a best-of-three series played over two weekends. Imagine playing a rival three times in eight days and then finishing it off in a game in Regina in late November. That's exactly what Calgary and Saskatchewan did in 1970 in a game regarded by many as the coldest ever. That was ugly. That was the coldest game I ever played in. I'm Ernie Afghanis welcoming you from Taylor Field in Regina. It's a very cold, brutal, wintry afternoon here in Regina. The temperature is three above, but the winds are from the north at about 25 miles an hour, which gives us a wind chill of 35 below zero. Well, I'll tell you. If cold would clog your mind, I probably wouldn't remember anything. Possibly the worst conditions ever in a Western Conference Final. I remember. We, w we went, out of, went out of the dressing room, and the officials were standing there, and they said, listen, we're not even going to sing the national anthem. We're just going to go and line up, flip the coin to see which end you want, and that's the way it started. Have you ever had to play in conditions such as these in all your time here in the CFL? No, no not, not this bad. It's been cold before, but the wind is a big factor there, I think. Since Wayne Harris was calling signals and stuff and that, and he couldn't even move his lips because his face was just all puckered up in that, and he was trying to talk, and he couldn't. This will be it for the Calgary Stampeders or the Saskatchewan Rough Riders for the 1970 season. It's right at the end of the game, and someone says, well, we got to try field goal. And the coach says, no, it will never, never get it there. So I said to the coach, I said, coach, let him kick it. But he's got to kick it out of bounds and let the wind move because the wind was just sweeping. The fans are on their feet. There's the kick. It's good. The ball went up, and it almost stopped, and the wind just pushed it. It just barely fell over the, the goal post. It was unbelievable. I mean, that's why they called the miracle kick, because he said, I had no idea where it was going to go. What a finish to a football game. Deplorable conditions, but a most exciting final in the best of three Western Series. We got to the ballpark on Saturday, and it was, it was just horrible. A heavy fall of snow and an unexpected thaw the morning of the game left a sloshy field of mud, water, and slush. They tried to shovel it off, and they couldn't do it. So they got little bulldozers, and they pushed it off. Well, you can imagine the mess that was left after that. It was literally four to five inches of mud. And so Toronto Argonauts, Eastern champions, and Winnipeg Blue Bombers, Western champions, meet on a watery, muddy field in Varsity Stadium for the 1950 Canadian Football Championship. The ball got covered in mud, and uh, Teddy Tugard and I were punt returners. We couldn't catch the ball. So what we did was we just lined up the ball, we let it hit the mud, picked it up, and ran with it. I mean, it sounds hilarious, but that's exactly how bad it was. The old saying is you can't tell the players without a program doesn't apply today. The program wouldn't help you this afternoon. You couldn't tell numbers, because most of the numbers got covered in mud. And a player is hurt over in that pool of water that may be Buddy Tinsley. Did you nearly drown? No, I never drowned. Never even came close to just push the mud off of me. It'd fall like that, and uh, 
be uh, everybody looking at you is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> At different times in my career, I have been disappointed that I've not had an opportunity to play in a game like that because it, that game did not resemble the game of football, but it's still a game. The game suddenly transforms into something else. It's more of a survival game, and you have to develop new strategies and different techniques, literally different techniques on the field. Uh, so I wish I'd played in at least one game that resembled that game, but I certainly wouldn't have wanted to play in more than one. You can't picture playing in a field that's so bad. But it's a classic in itself because it was the famous Mud Bowl. We are down to number one. It's ridiculous to, to think when you watch the film of that, watch the video of it, that they actually tried to play football. Find out what caused the only postponement of the Grey Cup game in history. That's next. <laughs> The Toronto Argonauts used to play at CNE Stadium off the shores of Lake Ontario, and when the fog rolled in, it would make its way to the stadium as well. In the 1962 Grey Cup game, there were over 32,000 fans in attendance, but I don't know how many people actually saw the game. Here is the number one CFL's craziest weather game, the Fog Bowl. My dad used to tell me about that all the time, the legendary fog ball. The Thai Cats and the Blue Bombers, one of many times that they've been in the Grey Cup. When game time came along, there was fog in the air, but every, every seat was taken. While the weatherman has indicated conditions tomorrow will be no different, we've decided to take the gamble and proceed. Hmm, I wonder if this clammy fog will hold off. The fog kept descending and uh, moving in on the field. It's ridiculous to, to think when you watch the film of that, you watch the video of it, that they actually tried to play football. Great loose, boosts his way for a barely visible 64 yard return. Barrow was the reported tackler. But if you threw a long pass or punts that got up into the air a bit, then you could lose the ball before it came out of the fog. The fog which has been swirling around the stadium closes in. ABC Wide World of Sports was telecasting the game at the time. That was the first game I ever watched. It was televised in the United States, and, and, and of course, the fog rolls in, and you don't see the, uh, the whole game. From my understanding, if you're up in the stands, and it's the fan who comes to support the game and pays the price to see the game, they were the ones that had a little height looking down and looking through the fog. They couldn't see some of the plays. The game is called and will be continued tomorrow, Sunday, with nine minutes and 29 seconds of the fourth quarter still to be played. So that was interesting to go in and uh, take off all your gear, take a shower, go home, sit around, get a night's sleep, get up the next day, strap it back on and go out and finish the last nine minutes. Sunday dawn with just a slight haze hanging low over the lakefront. The fog bowl, most people ask me about that all the time. Time runs out for the Tri Cats and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers defeat the Hamilton Tiger Cats by a final score of 28 to 27. Those are the sorts of games which, which live in, in, in infamy and, and um, uh, the league gets good for the league. That's some pretty crazy stuff. We hope you enjoyed the show. From all of us here, thanks for watching. We'll see you again.